京が死んで僕が生まれた「新女神転生3ノクターン HD リマスター」。This game right here was one I've been wanting to play for years now. I remember discovering it while going through YouTube back in 2015 and being mesmerized by the graphics, atmosphere, and gameplay. And after years and years of trying to emulate it on my potato ass laptop, and by the way, it failed a lot, I managed to soft mod my PS2 so that I can finally play it. And that summer during the peak of the pandemic is still ingrained in my mind, and for months I wanted to do nothing but talk about it. And after about a year or two, we're finally here reviewing Nocturne. And before we talk about anything else, though, we do need to talk about the development history because. Yep.、Uh, it's been nine years since we got in a mainline game. Oh boy. Alright, so let's recap real quick. In 1987 and 1990, we got the Digital Devil Story games, which would set the basic foundation for future SMT titles in terms of gameplay and story. In 1992, we had SMT 1, which built upon the multiple endings in Megami Tensei 2 by adding the alignment system, yet, despite the new addition and improved gameplay, the game itself was damn near broken to the point where you could cheese every boss fight. And in 94, we had SMT 2, which not only added demon inheritance, but also improved on elements such as the atmosphere and the story. And then there was SMT F, which was a game, a very annoying one. But after the release of F, there wasn't any plans to continue the SMT series. And while I couldn't find a concrete reason behind this, one can only guess it was due to hardware limitation, among other things. So, from then on, Atlas started making spin offs of the SMT games, starting with Devil Summoner in 1995, released for the sake of Saturn. This game was different from the other games, going for a more detective and light occult influence. Hell, in terms of reception, this game was really popular in Japan, so much so that it ended up getting a live action TV series, and. Yeah. But an interesting thing about this game was that there was a possibility of this game being ported to the West. However, those plans ended up failing, and I can only imagine that if this game came out in the West, Pokemon would look like a fucking saint compared to Devil Summoner. However, we in the West did get our first piece of Megaton, albeit from a new spin off game, Jack Bros. Released on the red VR box that more than likely made kids have to get glasses. And I'm not kidding about the game, not the glasses part, not the glasses part. But I think either way, though, this game predates another spin off we will end up getting being Megami e n b u n Roku Persona, or Revelations Persona here in the States. Beyond the other games Atlas was releasing at the time, Kosi Okada and his team were brainstorming ideas on a new number title that would appeal to a wider audience. Eventually, when they were introduced to the PlayStation 2, they realized that this platform here would be needed to meet their vision. During the early seasons of development in 2000, they began testing how the model conical's demons in the 3D space. And after about two years of making different prototypes and tech demos for the game, development fully kicked up in 2002, taking only a year to finish. And we finally ended up getting Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne. Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne released in Japan in 2003 for the PS2. But this original version had a lot of cut content, so the following year, the Maniacs Edition released in 2004. And we in the US ended up getting this game on October 12th of the same year. The game has you playing as a high school student who, after going to the hospital to meet with your teacher, the world ends up ending and you're transformed into a half human, half demon hybrid known as the Demi Fiend. From there, you have to explore this mysterious new world and figure out who to side with for creating a new one. Compared to SMT 1 and 2, Nocturne was a completely different beast, not just in scale, but also in presentation, atmosphere, gameplay, and so much more. Also, in the Maniacs version, not only did we get a slew of new content, but we also got Dante from the Devil May Cry series with a great seal of approval on the cover. Yes, I acknowledge the meme, and I'm only doing this once. Trust me, I won't be a nauseous with it. Plus, this game was a big deal for Atlas as this was the first time they were bringing the mainline franchise over to Western territories. Not only did we in the US get this game, but all of our European homies ended up getting this game as well, though under a different title. SMT Lucifer's Call, which quite frankly is a cool ass title for this game. Reception wise, this game ended up getting a lot of positive reviews, with many people loving the gameplay, story, and dungeon design, with the only criticism being that it could use some polishing on some of the environments, but nonetheless, it was still. 
still a big win. Now, this game was re-released in 2008, replacing Dante with Rhino, and was titled Maniac's Chronicle Edition, to celebrate the second Rhino game coming out at the time. And later in 2020, Atlas announced a remaster for Nocturne which was based off the Chronicle Edition, and released here in May of 2021 for the PS4, Switch, and PC. Now, originally I was going to review the PS2 version of the game because it's a way that I experienced it and also get a chance to you know, play on actual hardware. Hell, I even went as far as to buy the PS2 version for this review. That was until my fucking PS2 started breaking all because of this fucking laser. The game worked one time before absolutely failing, and my other PS2 games were fine as well until May, when it stopped running to read DVDs at all. And ever since I found this out, I tried doing every fix imaginable. I even cleaned the bitch, and I even went so far as to fix the voltage of the laser. But poof. Nothing. My PlayStation 2 has outright refused to read DVDs and can only read CDs at the time of recording gameplay. And at the time of me recording this video, I've been waiting to get it fixed without having to spend an arm and a leg for it. So, guess which version of the game we're gonna have to talk about? The HD Remaster. Oh boy, and I have a lot to say about this port, but I'm going to save that until the end of the video because we got a story to get into pretty long one for the most part. The story begins with a woman saying that for the world to be born again, it must first die and wants to help you in surviving sin. During this, we end up naming our character and the woman whose name is Yuko Takao. After that, we begin the game in Tokyo where we have to meet up with our teacher. And on our way there, we keep hearing about an incident that happened at Yoyogi Park involving a brawl that rumor has it had demons involved. We end up learning more about this from a journalist named Hijiri, and later we head to the hospital where our friends Chiaki and Asamu is also searching for our teacher. We end up heading into the basement of the hospital to search for her only to encounter a man with the same hairline as Vegeta, named Akawa, who decides to kill us for trespassing, but we're saved by our teacher Yuko who then tells us to meet them on the roof where we end up getting hit with some heavy information. Yuko states that in a little bit the conception is going to take place, an event where essentially the world is going to end and she wants us to find her after the event ends. And at that moment, BOOM! The world starts shaking, lightning starts striking every fucking where, black shadows from the death of everyone around us is appearing, and suddenly the ground comes up like a massive tidal wave with a giant ball of light encapsulating everything like BOOM! The mayhem ends up seizing, and we're met with a ball of light who analyzes us and tells us to discover ourselves. Immediately afterwards, we end up meeting a mysterious old lady and a creepy ass kid who holds us down and gives us this mysterious parasite thingy, turning us into the Demi Fiend, a being with the power of a demon and the heart of a human. After our transformation, we end up in a hospital morgue where we later discover that the world we knew has ended, and we're in this world known as the Vortex World. We encounter Hijiri again, who we decide to team up with, and after meeting with a pixie and finding our way out the hospital, we begin exploring this new world. During the initial exploration, we meet up with Chiaki, who is shaken up by the events thus far, and we discover two particular cults vying for control over the new world. The first cult is the Assembly of Nihilo, being led by Hikawa and the Maiden, and the second cult is the Mantra, being led by Gozo Tenno. Heading to Ikebukuro to meet with him, we encounter Isamu getting got by Dor, with him later putting us in jail and having us go through a trial by ordeal, aka fighting for our fucking lives, and to make matters worse, directly after fighting Dor and trying to get back into the Mantra HQ, we end up encountering Raido or Dante, depending on if you're playing the PS2 version or the remaster. After that battle, we meet with Gozo Tenno, who starts an evasion on Nihilo's HQ. Going into the headquarters, we encounter Hikawa again, who ends up explaining a little bit on how this world works, being Magasuki. Think of it as magnetite, but everyone including humans have it. During the explanation, we also learn that our teacher is the Maiden and is being held up somewhere in this world. Afterwards, Hikawa ends up activating the Nightmare System, which ends up extracting the Magasuki from everyone in the mantra, including Gozo Tenno. After defeating Hikawa's lackey and meeting with a destroyed Gozo Tenno, we continue to explore the world some more, during which we learn of a mannequin named Futomimi, who can accurately tell the future and we end up saving him and our friend Isamu, with the latter going into the Imala network, feeling as if we're worthless and trying to help him or our teacher. We then head to Asakusa, which is the birthplace of the mannequins, and we learn from Hajiri that our teacher is being held up in this area known as the Obelisk. We head over there to defeat the Moray sisters and later save her. Yuko ends up realizing that she was being used by Hikawa and decides to conceive her own reason by partnering with a goddess named Oradia. Afterwards, we are met with the old lady and creepy ass kid again, who states that the time for creation is coming, with people going out to spread their own reasons. Alongside this, with our status as a demon, we can conceive our own reason and instead have to follow whichever reason we want. And speaking of which, this is probably a good time to go into the reasons themselves. 
A reason is a philosophy on how the new world should be modeled as. They're like alignments from SST 1 and 2, but more detailed in the sense of being able to imagine how that reason will work in the new world. In this case, imagine a reason where everyone in the world is equal. Well, in order for it to come to fruition, you need a large amount of Magasuhi in order to summon a god that represents that reason. Now, in the context of the game, there are three overall reasons. The first reason is from Chiaki, who represents the Yosuga reason. A world where the strong and beautiful are valued, while everyone that's not in that camp is killed off. So, basically, social Darwinism. Huh? The second reason is from Isamu, who represents the Masubi reason, a world where everyone has a world to themselves effectively being alone. And the final reason is from Hikawa, who represents the Tsujima reason, a world of stillness where war, disease, and famine, and all that other shit isn't there anymore, but at the cost of individuality being white. And this actually helps explain what to expect from the middle point in the game, as during the exploration of the Vortex world, we're learning each character's reasons and making a decision on whether or not to join them or not. And at certain points of the story, we also see the characters' transformation into their gods. The first transformation happens for Isamu in the Amala Network, where what the fuck? What is that? What the fuck is that? Ugh, bro, why the fuck are their faces moving on his body? Atlas, what type of body horse shit are y'all inspired by? Oh, and by the way, it gets even better with Chiaki growing another damn arm that's built like a tree. What the fuck? Oh, man. Ah, uh, Jesus Christ. Let's just talk about what happens during all of this. During this section of the game, we go to Yoyogi Park and get the Yehiro no Himorogi from our teacher, an artifact being what's needed to help create a new world. Directly afterwards, we meet with Hijiri, who has gone crazy in power after using the Yamala drum and decides he wants to create his own reason. But he's kidnapped by Isamu, and after helping him defeat some demons to gain access to his inverted pyramid, Isamu sacrifices Hijiri and becomes the first person to transform into his god, being Noah. And yes, I'm pretty sure Noah looks like a fetus, and I'm not going there today. Back at Asakusa, a transformed Chiaki is going through Mili Futashiro killing mannequins, and I'm pretty sure she just called this mannequin a slur. But anyway, after killing Futamimi, she transforms into her god, Ball Avatar. Finally, at the Diet Building, Hikawa manages to get access to a large amount of Magasuhi in the building and transforms into Aramon. During this, our teacher tries to stop him, but she isn't able to and is abandoned by Aradia and is absorbed into Aramon. With everyone's gods summoned and the reasons close to being conceived, we summon the Tower of Kagasushi with the Yehiro no Himorogi and begin our climb up. Shit. Oh, shit, I'm forgetting the Labyrinth of Amala. I'm not even gonna hold you, I did not know where I was gonna put this in the story synopsis. Okay, beyond the three reasons, there are three other reasons being the Freedom, Demon, and the True Demon ending. With the Freedom ending being inherited to us from Yuko Takao. Now, as for the True Demon ending, this ending can be obtained by fighting all the fiends and going through the five Kalpas, and you have to do this all prior to going into the Tower of Kagasuchi. This option is first shown to us after going to the Amala Network for the first time and getting the menorah from this woman here. This is also where Dante and Raido comes in, where in the third Kalpa they try to stop you from collecting the other menorahs and going deeper through the Labyrinth. And despite being different characters, they'll still chase your ass and shoot you in the back like Ricky and Boys in the Hood. Ricky! We fall down, but we get up. Once in the Tower of Kagasuchi, we end up fighting and defeating Hikawa, Isamu, and Chiaki, collecting three stones needed to meet with Kagasuchi. From there, we have to battle him either to convince him of a reason or because he wants to stop us from destroying the cycle of rebirth and death. Depending on which reason you side with determines the ending you'll get. And let's just get this out of the way real quick. The endings for Yosuga, Masubi, and Shijima are all anticlimactic, with some short dialogue and a ball of light encapsulating everything. Then you have the demon ending, which ends with you in the vortex world as the means of creation is gone. Next is the freedom ending, which ends with the world returning to normal, but not only do we still have our demonic power, just without the tattoos and shit, but we're gonna have to use it for the battle against the true enemy. And finally, it's the true demon ending, where it's revealed that this old man and creepy ass kid is Lucifer, and he decides to test our strength to see if we're worthy of leaving his demon army. And after defeating him, we fully turn into a demon and go off to fight the true enemy. Is it Yahweh? The Great Well? Uh, who knows? Oh, Jesus Christ, are these synopsis only gonna get longer? Ah, fuck! Okay, in terms of my opinion on this story, this is one that won't seem standard at first if you're used to playing other JRPGs. Hell, when I first played this game, I damn there had no clue how to process the story because it wasn't really in my face like other games. But it wasn't until my subsequent playthroughs that I understood it a lot better because I acknowledged the downtime that was in the game. 
So for those curious on what downtime is, think of it as the story not being active and gives you a moment to process what the fuck just happened. And this is the case for most of the SMT games, but it's especially the case in Nocturne, because the story is, you know, mostly up to you. Sounds similar? Yeah, because it's similar to the SMT1 story. The contrast though being that there's something that's driving you to continue forward to the end and has a world that's more likely going to pique your interest. Speaking of the world, this game does a great job with its world building. It makes this with the game's downtime and lore so you have a game where you might spend most of your time roaming around. Though some of the environments are a little bland, it does have variety so I'll give it that. Now if I had to compare the world of this game to something, it would easily be Mad Max due to it not just taking place in a desert but also how chaotic everything is. And for that, like in SMT2, this game explores how a chaotic world will look like. In contrast to its predecessor where in a law world you are protected but in return you live under an iron fist, the world in Nocturne is completely free, meaning that you can do anything and everything you want with little to no consequence. Next are the characters, which are really good and have some layers to them that makes them stand out from the characters from before. First we have Chiaki. Chiaki is one of her closest friends who's intelligent yet has a haughty demeanor and looks down on lazy people like Isamu. Speaking of which, we have Isamu, our other close friend who's laid back and cocky but in actuality is just a wimp. Next we got Hikawa, the man behind the events of the entire game. He's often calm, collected, and dedicated to his goals. And finally we have Yuko, our teacher who is confident as all hell and has a very optimistic attitude. Simple character explanation, I know, even for me. But there is one thing that makes these characters all relatable, all the same, and where I can just say one word and it's fucking done. They're hypocrites. Oh, okay, you know what? Okay, let me explain real quick. All the main characters are essentially hypocrites, not just in their reasons, but in their character as well. For example, Isamu wants to build a world where everyone is by themselves without the assistance from others. Yet, Asamu during most of the game is often asking for our help from us, the player. Another example is Chiaki, who despite wanting to build a world for the strong and beautiful, is weak. She went through the whole journey struggling without any allies and often running from fights, and whenever she does fight is easily overpowered, as evidenced from her meeting with Gozo Tenno, where you know, she lost her fucking arm. Now there's obviously more examples, especially from Yuko, cause she's the most hypocritical of them all. But these hypocritical natures are even more interesting after seeing everything from your first playthrough was, was a really nice touch. Another thing about this story that I really like is that when going for the true demon ending, whenever you finish the Kalpa, you end up getting more details about the lore of the game, ranging from the characters we've met so far to the concept of the Amala network being a multiverse of different worlds. And these explanations here are where most of the popular fan theories come from, especially with Hijiri being a reincarnation of Elf. Which fun fact, he isn't, and if you really want to know why, then check out LaRue's video on it, link below. As for any issues, I didn't really have any as the story gives you enough incentive and drive to see it through to its completion. Plus because of the limited cast, everyone is fleshed out besides Sakahaki. Um, if there's one thing I would change, it would be to either give him a better antagonizing role in the story, or just eliminate him entirely. Now we got the gameplay, and... Nocturne ended up changing a lot of things, and I mean a lot. And you see, my biggest problem is that I don't know exactly how I want to explain this or compare it to something so that y'all can understand how big of a deal it is. So, um, damn, okay. You know what, before we go into Nocturne's gameplay, let me ask y'all this. Have y'all played Final Fantasy IV before? Final Fantasy IV gameplay wise changed up the formula of combat with the active time battle system. Unlike in the past three Final Fantasy games where you took your time picking actions, the ATB system made it so that battles were more tense since you were kind of on a timer and had to make sure to choose your action to avoid getting mollywhopped by the enemy. Yet this system still retained the basic aspects of Final Fantasy with how it's turn based and of course having a good party setup. With this change, it gave Final Fantasy a sort of unique identity compared to the other JRPGs released at the time, and later would be the basis for future Final Fantasy games up until Lightning Returns, with there being various iterations of the system that switches things up. Now, admittedly, this might not be the best example of a formula change within the series, and trust me, I feel like someone could do 10 times better when talking about an RPG that massively changes the formula for the series. However, whenever I think about that, 
I often think about Final Fantasy IV. And the reception of it was welcome and was approved over the years with the best usage of it probably being either Final Fantasy VI or Final Fantasy IX. And this will be a similar case with Nocturne's new press turn system. How this system works is that you have four turn icons split between you and each party member. Each action takes up a turn and you can pass it to a party member to get a half turn. Now, if you hit an enemy with their weakness and or hit them with a critical hit, you can get another half turn. And if you repeat this, then you can stack them up for another round of turns. And after all your turn icons are gone, it will be the enemy's turn and if you or your party members nullifies or dodge an attack, then the enemy loses two turn icons. And if they repel or absorb the attack, then the enemy loses all their turns. But be mindful that this also applies to the enemies as well. If they hit you or your party members with their weakness or hit a critical, then they gain half turns. And in the same case, if your attacks get repelled, absorbed, and so on and so forth, then you get the point. This system makes it so that you have to be more attentive to how you're building your team in regards to y'all resistances. As such, the next major change is that there's no equipment like in the other games. Instead, you have the Magatamas. Magatamas are collectible items that can affect the player's stats, abilities that you can obtain, and your resistances. And overall, there are 25 Magatamas in this game, each with their own set of moves and resistances, many of which are obtained through boss battles or can be purchased at different shops. This means for the first time in the mainline games, you can actually learn magic. Plus, you're free to choose what build you want to rock with for the entire game. You can have a straight up magic build, physical build, or a mixture of both. Plus, some Makatamas have no abilities and does exactly what you expect them to do. Now, oftentimes it's a good idea to be constantly changing your Makatama depending on the dungeon slash boss battle you're about to encounter. For example, if a boss mainly uses light magic, then you need a Makatama that'll have a strong resistance to it. And make sure to keep up on this or you're going to fucking hate your life when you're constantly dying. There's a lot of other changes in this game, many of which are just... Oh, it's so fucking good. First of all, Magnetite is outright gone here, meaning you can have your demons in your party without burning through resources. Speaking of demons, despite being limited to a party of four, you can recruit up to 12 demons by the halfway point of the game. And when it comes to recruitment, it's been simplified to where you have to make sure to give the demons the items that they want, as well as doing the right dialogue at the end. However, this is still sort of a hit or miss, but luckily, demons have negotiation skills that can prevent them from running away. Hell, a demon themselves can actually recruit demons for you, which is actually pretty cool. As for fusing demons, the demon inheritance is back, and you can do the standard fusion. However, to do a triple fusion, you have to wait until a full moon in order to do it. Now, new to the mid inline games is the Demon Compendium, which has a list of all the demons you've ever obtained, and you can buy them back for a necessary fusion if wanted. However, um, the higher the level, the more expensive it is, and yeah, these motherfuckers can get expensive. Now, in terms of the remaster, you do have the option to freely choose which skills demons can inherit, which I'm pretty sure was done in the later Make It 10 game, but it's still a welcome addition that'll definitely make you stay at the Cathedral of Shadows a lot longer. Another new thing in this game is that at a certain level, a demon can evolve from its current form. There's over 24 demons that can evolve, and the ones that do end up being way better than the original. Prime example being our Habaki, which evolves from Mononofu and has a resistance to almost half of the attacks any other enemy can throw at you. Other than that though, the game's perspective also ended up changing from being first person to third person, which actually is pretty great. It controls well, if a little floaty sometimes, but it's barely noticeable. Though I am going to miss the novelty of first dungeon crawling, but at least the speed isn't going to be annoying. And this speed also plays a unique part in the dungeons. Oh Christ. Nocturne's dungeons are weird. Not in the way that these were designed, but mainly the fact that you could be backtracking to these areas multiple times. Overall, there are about 27 areas in this game, with 15 of them being actual dungeons, 12 of these areas simply being hub areas, and if you're going for the true demon ending, add the 5 calpas for the library of Amala, and you actually have about 32 areas to go through. Yeah, um, it's a lot. So I'm gonna make this easier for me and for you, the viewer, because this video is already going long enough as is. The easiest way to describe all the dungeons in this game is that they all have a puzzle slash gimmick to them. This gives every individual dungeon a sense of identity, as well as in this case for me and you, the scream at the top of our lungs. Now, some of the notable dungeons in this game that I think are really good is the Obelisk, Yogi Park, and Kabukicho Prison. 
The Obelix Dungeon requires the player to walk on these special platforms and match it to the corresponding moon phase on the blockade. Now, if you mess up and go into a new moon, then you'll end up falling to the floor below. It's a pretty simple dungeon besides the fact you know you're going up and down, up and down the stairs. Though, it is a nice little brain teaser, especially for the last one. Yoyogi Park is another nice one where you have to make sure not to go under the bridge where a pixie is. Now, for the first few parts of the dungeon, you have a platform that gives you a view on where they are. But after going through two of these areas, you'll have one where the pixies change formations after you bypass them. Now, the last part before the boss fucking sucks, but it is redeemed by like 80% of the other areas being pretty unique on how you approach it. Finally, it's Kabukicho Prison, and when you get a Yumugi Stone, then you end up inverting the entire dungeon. It's another relatively quick dungeon, though the only annoying thing about it is that you have to figure out the right path for the end. And that can be really annoying, especially if you get your equilibrium, whatever the fuck, messed up. As for the other dungeons, they're not necessarily bad, especially because they all don't overstay their welcome. Besides uh, two particular ones, being the Amala Temple and Puzzle Boy. <laughs> Oh, fucking puzzle boy. In Asakusa, mind you, this is optional by the way, you can get another Magatama by playing this game called Puzzle Boy. And, oh, oh Christ, this shit is infuriating. You have 20 levels to go through with the puzzles getting harder and harder, and it doesn't make it any better that these levels made me want to shove my head into a wood chipper because of how specific you gotta do them. It could be because I'm not as smart as I was at one point, but I don't even know. After the 20th level, I was just glad to have this dungeon be over with. Oh, and fun fact, I ended up dying from a random encounter that used Hama after beating the puzzles, and I had to do them over again. So uh, this is your friendly reminder to always save your game or you're gonna cry like I did. And finally, the Ambala Temple, which, fuck this dungeon, the first area has you finding a way to get to the boss room below it, the second area is a fucking teleport maze, and in the third area, you have to find your way to the boss room, just like the other ones, but if you hit a single shadow, prepare for damage floor hell. Now the bosses themselves are even more annoying, with the easiest being Albion, but Asiel and Scotty can both eat a dick. Asiel can one-shot your party with Soul Niger, and if he buffs himself to high hell, he can even kill your entire party. And Scotty is even worse, she can drain physical attacks, and if she buffs herself to high hell as well, she can kill your entire party with Earthquake. That right there is some fuck shit. And don't get me started on the Labyrinth of Amala. If you think the base game dungeons are easy as hell and you want a challenge, then go through the Labyrinth of Amala where each cowboy makes you want to scream. But to advance through them, you have to fight the fiends, which in retrospect aren't really that hard if you prepare for them. And this applies to the other bosses as well, with the exception of two I mentioned earlier as well as Mother Harlot, Trumpeter, Beelzebub, and Kagasuchi. But what about Matador? What about him? He is an easy ass fight, especially if you know what you're doing. And I'll help y'all with one piece of advice. Get to Hifumi Magatama, you'll thank me later, but on to the real bosses. Mother Harlot is one of the prime examples of needing to have a diverse party set up, because if not, you're gonna be stuck for a bit. She can repel physical attacks as well as drain electricity. Add to the fact that she has a lot of HP, and she's gonna take 20 minutes out of your day trying to fight her. Luckily, if you have some death stones lying around and feel like grinding a bit, then you should get Dai Sojo, the ultimate sucker demon. He has a move called Meditation. It's an almighty spell which can take a bit of HP slash MP from an enemy. And here's the fun part. If you combo this move with a shit ton of Makakajas and Rakundas, you damn near can suck the HP and MP out of her. And hell, almost any boss for that matter. This skill is so broken and the moment she loses her MP is when you damn near won the fight. So it's definitely a good idea to have him in your party here. Next is Trumpeter, and if you want to talk about hard battles... <laughs> Art, I don't want to alarm you, but the power at the arrival of death! This fight is easily the hardest fight out of all the fiends, as this man has a gimmick where every four turns, he'll switch between using Holy Melody and Dark Melody. Now, Holy Melody can fully heal a party member or even the boss himself, and Dark Melody can outright kill the party member with the lowest HP. So, here's the thing. For this fight, you need to remember the cycle of Holy and Dark Melody, keep your buffs and debuffs up, and keep your health up as well, and kill this fucker before it's too late. I know it's a lot, but please do it and you will definitely nick me later. Also, he has over 11,000 HP. Oh, hell no! So, in terms of the library from Amala, we have Beelzebub, 
who is the boss of the fourth Kalpa and is difficult if you do not have the right Magatama or party setup. He has a move called Death Flies, which can kill anyone that does not have an immunity to death spells. So, it is imperative, extremely imperative, to be prepared for this fight. And while the Suck God can't do much here besides heal, you need to make sure to get your buffs and debuffs in during the first phase and make this fight quick as hell. Now, the final fucking boss, and man, this boss, I didn't have a lot of issues with on my first playthrough, but fam, what the fuck is up with the infinite light? So, how Kagasuchi works is like this. His first phase is sort of passive, you know, he ain't gonna do a lot, but the moment you get to that second phase, buff your defense immediately or he'll fuck you with a rusted metal spoon. While infinite light can only be used once every two turns, when he uses it, it deals a shit ton of damage. And if you use Rhydo's Provoke to lower Kagasushi's defense, you just bought yourself a one-way ticket to a game overseas. My best advice is to go hard in the first phase and play safe in the last phase, because if not, you're going to be fighting him in a non-stop, monotonous cycle of death and death and fucking death. Okay, so originally I was going to go through all the other dungeons because, you know, they're pretty cool, but this felt like the easiest and also quickest way to talk about them as well as my experience going through them, especially because of the bosses, which I felt had a bigger presence here than in the other Mega Ten games thus far. It had even a bigger presence than the dungeons in this game. But there's something else I want to talk about, and it's something that I normally never do in my reviews, especially for my Mega Ten reviews, which I feel like I should have done beforehand. And that is to talk about the music, the art, and specifically for this game, the HD Remaster. To get the small stuff out of the way first, I love the music in this game. It has an energy to it that fits with every mood and is a mix between electronic and hard rock. And this is also the first time that Soji Magera was the lead composer for a Megaton game. Fun fact. But the issue when playing the game itself is that the music sounds muffled. Now it could be for a variety of reasons, but two reasons that I ended up looking up was that one, it could have been for added atmosphere, which okay, I can buy. But the one I think makes sense the most is the you know saving disk space. But nonetheless, it's not bad, just a little annoying. The art, however, is great, and Kaneko's iconic design works perfectly in 3D. Also, if you've noticed how the human characters look compared to how they looked back in the 90s, they look really different and also creepy as hell to a certain extent. This was during the peak of Kaneko's art, where many of his human designs looked like lifeless porcelain dolls, and also had the signature black lipstick at the top. And it really adds to the feel of the mainline games being darker than other JRPGs. All good so far, so far, so good. Well, now we got the AC remaster. Oh, fuck me. Oh boy. So this port isn't exactly the best. While it does give some quality of life improvements, some improved visuals, and fixes to translation, this all comes at the cost of leaving the music quality the same and introducing new performance issues. Now, I'm going to be specifically talking about my experiences on the Switch, and if you notice from the footage, this game doesn't run that great, with it often dropping frames when there's a bunch of shit going on. And this is all on docked mode too, however, when I played it on the go, it was noticeably better, which in and of itself is ass backwards. Isn't the docked mode supposed to make the game run better since more is going to the GPU and not the battery? If not, then I might be overreacting, but still, Atlas should have put more work into this port, and that's the concept of the day. Now, if it was a simple upscaling, text fixing, remaster, then cool. I wouldn't complain that much. But this port introduces quality of life improvements and even DLC which weren't here in the original. Hell, there's a new difficulty mode for this game called Merciful Mode, which drastically increases your strength and lowers the enemy's attack and defense, you get more XP and maka after battle, and it drastically lowers the enemy encounter with the only way to experience the original being to use Riverama. These additions show that Atlas wanted more people to play this port, which, yes, they should, but it's hard to recommend it, especially on the Switch, with how the performance is. And honestly, I hope in the future, when Atlas goes to try to make more ports of games, they take more time in making it a better port than what we had here. Alright, 
I love Nocturne, alongside the millions of people on the internet, and honestly, who can blame them? It was the game that not only changed its own franchise with more accessible gameplay, but it also introduced a new battle system that is still being used in modern SMT games. Now, I will go as far as to say that this game is a perfect game. However, there's issues ranging from the mobile music and crazy enemy AI. Sometimes. And one of the things with the remaster, beyond what I mentioned before, is that many people were hoping that the issues from the PS2 version were going to be fixed. And I mean, it's more accessible than ever, and that's great. But issues from the PS2 version is still there, as well as the Switch version suffering from bad performance. And I'm gonna be honest here, as much as I ragged on the AC remaster, this is a cool ass way to play this game on the go. And I did it a lot, especially last year, when I was going to the airport and when I was going on different road trips and shit. But the problem is, is that it just, it just doesn't run well, especially on the dock for the Switch. What? Damn! Now, I don't know about the PS4 and PC versions, but I was disappointed with the Switch port. Plus, the price is just... Uh, it's not cash money to say the least. Overall though, I still love this game regardless of the remaster not being that great. It still has good things to it, but definitely should have gotten polished some more. The game overall though is great, remaster could just be a whole lot better. And I don't even have to tell y'all if y'all should play this game or not, because it's pretty simple. Hell yes, you should play this game. Overall, if you want a game different from Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, or other JRPGs you've played, then this game is a great starting point. Now, as for the version to buy, I recommend for you guys to determine whether or not the remaster is going to be worth it for y'all. Despite its issues, it's still a great way to experience this game, but if you do get it, get it on PC so you can add mods that improve the game's sound quality and also introduce some other nice changes. Now, if you don't care for the remaster and you got a PS2, then get that version as it's one out of the few PS2 games you can buy at a decent price. With that, thank you for not just watching to the end of the video, but also hitting the 50 subs! Woo! Yeah, baby! This means a lot, as it got me pumped for continuing to make videos for you guys. Plus, I appreciate all the feedback and love y'all gave to these videos, especially the feedback because, yeah, I ended up taking them in stride, and of course, everything is doing a lot better now. And also, the fact that this video right here is at 100 is crazy as hell. So, guys, here's hoping we can get to 100 subs by the end of the year, and also, we gotta review Ronde, uh, after this Megaton retrospect. <laughs> oh, fuck me. You know what? I'm just gonna make this known right now. If we're gonna do this, we're also reviewing Monster Tensei 1 and 2. Deal? Capiche? Please. <laughs> but for the next three to four videos, I am gonna be reviewing games that people have been recommending me to play, and also games that I kind of just been wanting to review for myself. Like always make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video, and make sure to stay safe, get vaccinated when possible, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.